Going home. Thank you, choir, praise team. I don't know about you. I'm ready right now. I wish before this service ended, we could hear that trump sound. Not the fire whistle. We get to hear that about every Sunday as well. But the trump sound to go home. I began this series last week that I've titled, What is this place called heaven? And I'll be honest with you, the inspiration of this series actually came from one of our deacons. Just a couple of weeks ago, after our service was over and we were at the front door and speaking with people, he began to ask me some questions about heaven. And so I, in turn, tried to answer a few of them on the spot, but at the same time, I said, pray about this thing. And evidently, he did, and as I began to, it was as if God said to me, if a deacon in your church who's been here for years now has questions about heaven, how many more people in the congregation do? And so I can probably pretty much assure you that through this series, even, we're, uh, even though we're going to be on it for probably a couple more weeks after today, I'm not sure if I'll be able to answer everybody's questions about heaven because there are so many. And we do have a limited amount of information that we're given in the Bible, but far much more than what many of us realize. So here's my encouragement to you. Now, again, the deacon basically came and was just kind of asking me a question about heaven in general. And through that, God inspired, I believe, this whole series. That's not like used to in days gone by. I could preach a message, especially in my early days, and I might have a few old gentlemen in the church and come up and go after the message. They'd say, well, preacher, that was a pretty good sermon, but let me tell you what you really need to be preaching on. <laughs> and I'll always think to myself, Okay, I'll be sure and let God know that, what it is I really need to be preaching on. So I share that to say this. If you've got questions, pray about them right now. Begin to pray and ask God and say, I want to know. I want to know. And you might just be surprised at how many of those questions are answered through this series with me having no idea what your questions are may actually be we're going to talk about a little bit of those things today as we get into the series but i want to begin with something else gordon zwicky won the top honors a few years ago in the burlington liars club contest they basically had a contest of who could come up with the best lie in the burlington liars club Zwicky, who was 72, beat out 299 other people across our nation as well as in Canada. And here's what his story said. He claimed that he and his wife Dorothy won the lottery, and they decided in celebration they were going to drive down to Florida and spend some time there. The problem was they'd never been anywhere before. But their neighbor next door told them, he said, listen, you won't have any problems. Everything will be fine as long as you pay attention to all the road signs. They said, great. So they loaded up in their car and they took off. Well, about 30 miles from their house, they saw the first sign. And it said, clean restrooms ahead. Well, two months later, they finally arrived in Florida. By that time, they had cleaned 450 restrooms <laughs> using 267 rolls of paper tiles, three cases of bowl cleaner, and 86 bottles of Windex. And they were so tired from all their work, they immediately left for home. Gordon won the contest with that made-up fable story. You know, thankfully, getting into heaven is not that hard. Or is it? Actually, trying to pay attention to all the signs and obey all the rules would be easy compared to what Jesus actually says is the way we get to heaven. He says getting to heaven is about giving up your life to experience the life of God. Remember his words? If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. This past week as we began this series, we looked at the realities, four different realities of heaven. That first and foremost, heaven is a real, literal place. It is a real location. We also saw last week 
that God is going to make the earth new and there's going to be a new heaven. But heaven, even as it exists currently right now, if you and I should pass before Christ comes back to make everything new, it's still a literal place. It's where all those who have died in Christ that we knew and loved that have gone on before us are there dwelling in the presence of God. Not with their resurrected bodies as I shared last week. That's something we will all experience together. But heaven is a real place. We saw last week also that there is a real presence. That God is there. That He is going to dwell among us. He is going to walk among His people. Now, does that necessarily mean that we'll see God every day? I'm not actually sure how all that will work. But think about it right now. Think of it in the sense of this. Even every time we go into the holy city. It's kind of like right now. I don't know about you, but I've never got to visit our actual nation's capital. I've been to Washington, D.C., but I've never actually got to visit the White House. I hope and pray before my life is over, I'll have that opportunity. But most of the people who do get to go always share one thing in common, even regardless of your political beliefs and even regardless of whoever's in the White House at the time occupying the office of president is somebody you voted for or not. While you're in there and you're on your tour, what you're hoping for more than anything else is just to get a glimpse. I hope I get to see maybe step out of the West Wing office and go down the hall and maybe even throw up a hand and wave. You're hoping you get a glimpse of the president up close, personal, in his own house. The most powerful man and the leader in the free world. How much more so is that going to be true with God and heaven? Some days we may just see the Father. Other days it may just be Jesus. We don't know. But we do know that there's going to be a real presence there. We also saw that there's going to be real peace. Unlike you and I have ever experienced on earth, we only get glimpses and taste of it here. Our peace sometimes may last for two minutes. It may last for 20. It may last for two days. But then in one moment, circumstances and situations can change and our peace vanishes. There's coming a day that that will never happen again. No more death. No more pain, no more tears, no more mourning. What is God promising us? Eternal peace forever. And lastly, we saw that this heaven is a place filled with real people. People just like you and I. People that fell short and come up short and sinned, yes. But people who also believe that by the blood of Christ, as we have sang repeatedly this morning, that we've been washed clean. That by his red blood, we've been washed white as snow. And so, those are the four realities of heaven that we looked at last week. Today, we're going to look at four of the glories of heaven. Take your Bibles and stand with me this morning. This is my Bible, the light into my path. I believe it is the indestructible, inexhaustible, infallible word of God I am who it says I am I can do what it says I can do my mind is alert my ears are open my heart is receptive to receive God's word today I will be forever changed I will never be the same in Jesus name amen If you haven't already, turn with me in that Bible to Revelation 21. We're going to pick up where we stopped last week, verse 10. Keeping in mind, again, this is the Apostle John. He was the last living of the original 12. He has basically on, been exiled to the island of Patmos as punishment for his Christianity and his public witnessing. And as he is there on that island on one particular Sunday, he says as he was basically having his time of worship, that he was transported into heaven. Now, I said last week, by, in body or spirit, we don't know. John actually tells us here in verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. 
having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels. And names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, and three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the width, and he measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. And he measured its wall, 72 yards according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. The material of the wall was jasper. And the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city were adorned with every kind of precious stone. And we're not going to read all of those this morning, but he goes through in in the next verse and lists jasper and emerald and sardonyx and um, beryl and uh, amethyst and topaz, all these different stones. And then picking back up at verse 21. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed, and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we continue through this series, and as we try to imagine a place that none of our eyes have ever seen, I pray, Lord, that you would open our spiritual eyes. Help us, we pray, Father, even if it's but small glimpses, to get a grasp of this which John saw. Things that he had to describe, but unlike anything he had ever seen. So nothing to compare it to. Help us, we pray, to understand all that we read of, all that you have made, created, and is awaiting us, and even more than we can imagine, is ours when our short time on this earth is done. But Father, until that time, help us, we pray, to reflect your glory here and now for such a time as this. We pray and ask you these in all things in Christ's holy name. Amen. I wonder today, how many of us are truly looking forward to a new heaven, a new earth, consciously, daily, maybe at least weekly, in our idle moments when our mind gravitates to whatever it is that excites us or interests us the most? What do we think about? The next new car, a movie, maybe just seen or planning on coming out, a business opportunity, a chance to get rich, an attractive date, a fun vacation, or the new earth and the new heaven. Likely, we look forward to many things more than we do the new earth and the new heaven. Eugene Peterson writes, if we don't want God or want Him very near, we can hardly be expected to be excited or interested in heaven. How much time do we spend in thought and prayer with God thinking about what our lives will be like in this new earth and new heaven in His presence? You know, somebody actually took the time to do some research for us. Do you know, if we live to be 75, think about this for a few moments and give you a little breakdown on your life and what you're going to spend it doing. 
you will spend three years in school. Now, some of you think, oh, I spent a lot longer than that. That would be 20, little 24 hours if you were there, 24 hours a day, three years stay. Out of your 75-year life, you'll spend three years equivalent of 24 hours a day in school. You'll spend seven years eating. You'll spend 14 years working. You'll spend five years driving and or riding in an airplane. You'll spend five years talking. Some of you, that'll be six or seven. You'll spend one year recovering from sicknesses. You'll spend 24 years sleeping. You'll spend 15 years amusing yourself. Now think about this. What if you spent every Sunday of your life Every Sunday of your life from 0 to 75 in church without missing a Sunday. How much time would that be? Five and a half months. Five and a half months. If you came on Sunday morning only. If you add in Wednesday nights, it would be 11 months. Not even a total year. Our lives are certainly brief. And there's no doubt. Many of us would be well advised to give more of a priority to the one who gave it to us. So last week we looked at these four realities of heaven. This morning I want us to look at the four glories of heaven. Again, look at verses 12 through 14. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates and the gates, and at the gates 12 angels. And names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Here's the first glory that John points out, and I want us to see here in God's Word. We're going to get to the city in just a moment. He begins by giving us a a few brief descriptions of the city, but then he goes into this portion and comes back to the city in just a moment. The glory of the saints. The glory of the saints. Think about it. Every or any entrance into heaven out of these 12 gates is going to have one of the saints, one of the 12 tribes of Israel's name written upon it. Even when you see the city from a distance, and if you weren't here last week, I personally believe, and even more so today, and I'll talk about that a little bit when we get to it, that this new heaven that John saw coming down, this new Jerusalem, this city, is going to be suspended above the earth. It's going to be what would be known as a satellite city. Whether it hovers 100 feet over the earth, 1,000 feet over the earth, I'm not sure, I can't tell you, the Bible doesn't give us a distance, but I believe this heavenly, holy, new Jerusalem city is going to hover above the new earth. Keep in mind, the new earth is going to be recreated in perfection just as it was in the beginning, just as it was for Adam and Eve in the garden. But above this new earth is going to be, I believe, this holy city. So if you're looking at it from the earth and looking up at the city, you're going to see some of the glory of the saints. Their names, the apostles, are written in the foundation. If you know Jesus Christ and you get to visit the city whenever you should choose, you're going to be reminded of the saints every time you walk in any one of the 12 gates that you go through. Now notice it tells us that there are gates on the south, gates the west, gates the east, gates the north. Why do we need all these gates to get into the city? Maybe these gates are going to be correlated with where you and I are from. See, when I walk up to one of them southern gates, I want to look at them angels and go, Hey, Bo, how y'all doing today? If I went in through one of the northern gates, I might say to the angel, Hey, where's Jesus today? And he'd say, He's over in the yard by the car. And I'd say, What? See, I, I wouldn't understand what they were talking about. So maybe the gates are correlated with where we live on the earth And the angels are actually going to have our dialect. And I'm not sure about that. That's just actually being a little funny. But what I do want you to notice here is the glory of the saints. How God honored these saints. 
for all eternity. For all eternity. Forever and ever. For the brief amount of time they live their life on this earth and the way they live their life to reflect God's glory when they were here, God says, now I'm going to reflect some of my glory to you forever. Forever. Their names will be permanently etched, the apostles in the foundations of the city and the 12 tribes of Israel at every gate. Forever. God honoring and giving glory, some of his glory sharing with the saints. It was only a nickel, just one simple nickel, but the owner was actually able to retire on it. It was one of only five nickels like it, and Ed Lee of Merrimack, New Hampshire, sold the nickel, forget this, $4.15 million. It is the second highest price ever reported paid for a rare coin. Speaking for the coin dealership which bought the nickel, Laura Serber called the 1913 Liberty Head the most famous of American rare coins. Owning a 1913 Liberty Head nickel is unlike owning any other coin in the world, she said. The AP story reported, Liberty Head nickels were minted from 1883 to 1912. Mrs. Liberty was replaced the following year by either the Indian or the Buffalo nickel. But five 1913 nickels depicting Miss Liberty were minted illegally, possibly by either a mint official or an employee. They were never put into circulation. They were actually considered illegal to own for many years because they were not regular issue. But then the coin surfaced in 1920s. Ed Lee bought the coin a couple of years before selling it for $3 million. So he actually made over a million dollars on his investment. Not too bad. Ed Lee was pretty smart. He knew a valuable coin when he saw it, and he knew the importance of making a good investment. It's much like a modern-day story of the parable Jesus told about the pearl merchant who found a rare pearl that was very valuable. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Dr. Jerry Vine said, before you can expect to get into heaven, heaven has got to get into you. The glory of the saints, God remembering these 12 men, the first 12 of Israel, then the 12 apostles. Now, you may say, well, preacher, we can't be one of those. You're right, I can't either. But you see, I believe God is going to honor those who honored him for all eternity in some way in this city as well. Maybe you'll have a street named after you. Maybe there'll be some column somewhere that your name's posted like one of these. But these guys were so significant in their lives, in following God, in his purpose and his plan, that they actually had their name etched for all eternity on the outside of the city. The second thing I want us to see, look at verses 15 through 21. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its walls. The city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the width, and he measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. And he measured its walls, 72 yards according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. The material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations, the foundation stones of the city were adorned with every kind of precious stone. And again, he lists all of those in verse 20. Verse 21. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. First we see the glory of the saints. Now John wants to point out to us the glory of the city itself. The glory of this city itself. It is unlike 
anything human eyes have ever seen. It is unlike anything that's ever been built and constructed on the earth. When you really begin to study the details in some of these words in the original language, the first thing you realize is these 12 foundation stones that it's talking about that makes up the foundation of the city appear to be to John one single stone. So even if it's topaz, it's a topaz stone that's 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide. Now, the foundation isn't as tall as the city, so it's not 1,500 miles high. But people I've often heard before and say the question of, you know, in God's house, Jesus said, in my Father's house are many rooms. How are we all going to fit? If all these people from all the generations and all the believers, how are we going to fit? We can't even right now wrap our mind around the size of a city such as this. 1,500 miles long. 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles high. I promise you, just as the ark held all the animals with room to spare, this city's going to have plenty of room to spare. Plenty of room to spare. But it's unlike anything that's ever been created, unlike anything that human eyes have ever seen before. Notice he says not only the 1,500 miles, and he measured its wall, 72 yards. The thickness of the wall is almost the length of a football field. That's 100 yards. That's how thick the wall is. In other words, anything, anyone can be up on top of the wall. Even the top of the wall itself may be a passageway like they were in days gone by. Some cities had walls so large they could actually drive horses and chariots upon them. But 72 yards, almost the length of a football field. And John says this is according to our measurements, which are actually the same ones the angels used. And then he tells us that the material of the wall was jasper and the city itself was pure gold, but yet like glass. Evidently a gold so clean, so pure, so refined that to John's eye, and I'm sure in all its brilliance and gleaming, and it almost appeared transparent. And then he tells us that even in these foundation stones were all these other, the 12 different stones of the gem world. And then the 12 gates, 12 pearls, each one of the gates was one single can you imagine? Can you imagine the size of the clam that they came out of? But a pearl, a humongous pearl, every one of the gates. See, our mind has never seen anything. The earth has never seen any kind of city that bears the glory of this city. C.S. Lewis was right. He said, there are better things ahead than anything that we'll leave behind. This city is unlike anything that's ever been seen on the earth. Charles Spurgeon, who the great English Victorian preacher, wrote about the death of a friend of his, Richard Baxter, who was the great Puritan preacher. But Baxter lay dying, and some friends came to see him. And they all asked him what we all ask at times like that. They said, Brother Baxter, how are you doing? And he was weak and obviously near death, but with great effort, he answered. And here's what he said. I am almost well. I'm almost well. Spurgeon explains, death cures. It is actually the best medicine. For they who die not only are almost well, but then healed forever. Death to the saints is not a penalty. It's not destruction. It's not even a loss. It's a gain that our tiny human minds can barely comprehend. And when we see this city, when we lay eyes upon this city, I believe that we're going to stand there in awe for quite a while. How's all this going to work? Now, again, some of this I'm going to share with you is my personal belief and my personal opinion based on 25 years of reading and studying this book and my personal relationship with God. Some of it I can't show you verbatim in His Word. Some of it I can give you some hints to where I come from my beliefs. But I believe 
in all eternity, when everything is made new, as we began in chapter 21 last week, when John saw the new earth and this new heaven, that people are going to once again live on the new earth just as we do now. As I shared last week, there was nothing wrong with God's plan originally. His plan was perfect just as creation was. It's us, the people that messed it up. So I believe people are going to live and function and walk all over the earth again. Whether we'll live in cities, exactly how things will be, I don't know that for sure. But then above the earth is going to be this holy city, this satellite city. And it's not somewhere that we're going to live and dwell forever. It's somewhere that we're going to visit. It's somewhere I believe that as saints and born-again believers, we're going to have the right to go anytime we want to. Yes, we're going to be living our life and doing whatever it is God has us to do on the new earth. But anytime we feel like it, we can say, hey, let's go to the city. Or I'm going to the city tonight. I'm going to see the Lord tonight. I just want to go to the city. I want to hang out there. How long are you going? I don't know. How long are you going to stay? I don't know. You're in eternity. A hundred years. What's a hundred years when you're in eternity? But I believe that we'll have the right to go to this city. But even those living on the earth, when they see the glory of this city, as we're going to read in a few moments, it's actually going to light up the earth. There won't be a sun or a moon any longer. It's going to be this satellite city and God's glory emanating from this city that lights everything up. So John points out the glory of the saints. Then he points out to us the glory of the city. Notice next, verse 22, And I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. Y'all want some good news tonight? You ain't got to go to church in heaven. You ain't got to go to church no more. You ain't got to never listen to another sermon again. You don't even have to pray. Why? You're going to be in the presence of God. If you've got a request, you can walk up to him and say, Lord, I need to talk to you about something. Tell me. He already knows what it is for you. Tell him. You won't have to get on your knees and go in your prayer closet or come to an altar. You won't ever have to listen to another sermon. There's not going to be a temple. Not going to say meet you at church on Sunday. The whole city, in a sense, because of God the Father and God the Son's presence there is going to be the temple, the tabernacle. The church. It's going to be a place of continual worship then, even as it is now. Listen, as we're sitting here right now, kind of somewhat quiet and somber, there's a party going on in heaven. The Bible says that there are angelic creations surrounding the throne of God who never cease to praise Him. There's a party going on right now. They're praising, they're worshiping. And if somebody's just gotten saved somewhere, the volume level just went up another notch. The glory of the saints, the glory of the city, and the glory of the Father and His Son. That's what John points out here. Verse 22, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it. And its lamp is the Lamb. The glory. The glory of the Father and of the Son. And we're going to be able to see that they are one. Look the same, speak the same, act the same, love the same. But yet two distinct personalities. And then finally. Look at verse 24. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there. Its gates will never be closed. Before we look at the last glory, let's stop right there for just a second. Anybody in here ever had one of them nights before? It won't a, tw it won't a 12 hour night. It was a 24-hour night or maybe a 48-hour because it felt like it went on and on and on. 
Maybe because of someone's sickness. Maybe because you were by yourself and you heard a noise in the middle of the night and you were afraid. And all you could think about and wait for was just if the sun will just come up. If the sun will just come up, everything will be all right. John says, listen, in this new city, you ain't never got to worry about the sun coming up. Because number one, there's not going to be a sun. This new city, as well as I believe the new earth, is going to be illumined by the glory of God the Father and God His Son. So we won't need the S-U-N sun, nor the moon. But he said there won't be any night there. There won't be any night. Think about all the things, just as we talked about last week, that the seas represent. Fear and division and the unknown and the storms. In so many ways, darkness does the same. That's when the majority of crimes are committed. That's when most terrible things happen is in the night. John says, there's no longer going to be any night. That the gates will never be closed during the daytime, but there's not going to be any nighttime. So what does that mean? The gates are always open. The gates will never be closed. For those who are in Christ, we will never be denied the access to this city. Anytime, anywhere, we may be on the new earth that we decide to go, we'll be able to. Finally, the nations will walk by its lights. The king of the earth will bring their glory into it in the daytime, for there will be no night. Its gates will never be closed, and they, us, will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Finally, we've got the glory of God's people. The glory of God's people. Notice it says the kings of the earth, and that's why I'm telling you there's going to be organization and civilization even as we know it now, not exactly as we know it now, because it will be perfect. It will be absolutely perfect. Any time, wherever you live, and the king that rules over your jurisdiction, you can guarantee that any law or anything he enacts is going to be perfectly right, perfectly just, perfectly honest, and the people will be pleased with it. It's a great reflection of the kind of king that David was. When you know and read and study, and yes, we all know about David's sin with Bathsheba, but when David was in his prime serving God as his king, the people loved him. The people basically adored him because he was such a good man, a compassionate man, a righteous man. They knew any time they went to their king that, number one, he was going to help them with their situation, and as their king, he had their back. He was going to watch over them, protect them, keep them, and cry out to God for his blessings upon them. That's the kind of kings that are going to be on this earth. And John says that not only the kings are going to bring their glory into it, but God's people. And they, verse 26, will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. That's you and us. Now, before we get into talking about how we bring God's glory into the city and what that means, let me answer a couple of those questions that some of you may have. Will we know who people were in our life when we get there? When we get to heaven, will we know who our wife and our father and our mother, brother, sister, cousin, school teachers, Sunday school teachers, etc.? Absolutely. Absolutely you'll know who they are. How do we know that? Well, here's how we know at least in part. You remember when Jesus took three of the disciples and went up on the mount and he was transfigured before them, basically he began to glow. The Bible says that, that his glory shone around them. And Moses and Elijah appeared and began to talk to him. Well, the first thing you recognize when you read that story is that the disciples knew instantly who Moses and Elijah were. Jesus didn't turn around and go, uh, hey guys, by the way, let me introduce you real quick. This is Elijah right here. And they knew. They knew who he was. Now, how did they know that? It could have been Noah. One of them guys could have been Abraham. One of them guys could have been uh, Jacob or Isaac. Or, but yet they instantly knew who they were. In the same way, you and I are going to know 
who everyone is. You're going to know who your mother, your grandmother, the Sunday school, you're going to know who everyone is. And you're going to be able to remember all of them. Now, understand also, we will not have relationships there like we have. The Bible says we will not marry and be given in marriage. And I've had people ask me before, especially wives whose husbands have gone on and vice versa. Am I going to know my wife, my spouse? Are they going to know me? Yes, absolutely they are. But you're not going to live together again as husband and wife forever. And here's the other part that we right now can't really comprehend and understand because of the effects of sin and, and the fact that our love is incomplete. Right now, God loves everybody exactly the same. It doesn't matter who it is, what they've done, his greatest saint that may be serving him on the face of the earth, whoever that may be right now. God loves them exactly as much as he loves Patty, as much as he loves Victoria. It's equally the same. When our love is equally the same, even though we know who all these people are, it's really not going to matter. It's not going to matter that... My, this was my mother because you're going to realize I love Tammy just as much as I love my mother. Yes, you'll know who they are. Yes, I guess we'll be forever linked in that aspect as family and we will know each other's identity, but relationships will be different then. And our love for everybody will be exactly the same. Now, John says that they brought God's glory into the city. What does this mean? It means just by simply going out and living righteous, sinless lives that we reflect God's glory first and foremost, but even as we come into the city, we're bringing His glory with us because we are simply a reflection of Him. We're simply a reflection of the Father and of the Son. Again, sharing a little story from Charles Spurgeon. He told a story about King Cyrus, the man who conquered Babylon and freed the Jews from captivity. And there was a visitor who was admiring Cyrus's garden. And he said, oh, king, you have no idea how much pleasure it gives me just to spend time here in your garden. Oh, said Cyrus, but you have not so much pleasure in this garden as I have. For I myself have planted every tree in it. And Spurgeon then commented, one of the reasons some saints will have a greater fullness of heaven than others is because they're going to be the fact that they did more to get others to heaven than others. Those words should call all of, cause all of us who know the Lord to do some serious thinking. How many people will be in heaven because of us? Our desire should be that when we reach our eternal home, some will say to us, I am so thankful for you. Your testimony, your life, the invitation you gave me that night to accept Jesus, that's why I'm here today. The Apostle Paul anticipated the joy in heaven of seeing people who were there as a result of his ministry. Yes, heaven's joys will be the fullest for those who have helped lead others to Christ. So what do we do? We need to do everything we can to not only make sure we're going, but to make sure those who are lost. That's how we lay up our treasures in heaven. You know, one of my favorite songs right now is a song by the name of Jeremy Camp. And actually, just to give you a little uh, quick preview of upcoming things, on October 1st, here in the city of Federal, Franklin Graham is going to be doing a crusade downtown in our city at Festival Park, October the 1st. Go ahead and make a mental note of that. Jeremy Camp's going to be doing the music and leading the worship that night. And I'll be able to share with you more about that after uh, this week I'm going to a planning meeting. A great opportunity for you to invite somebody that you don't know. Somebody that you may not be able to get into the doors of a church and just invite them to go down to Festival Park with you that night. And Franklin Graham will be sharing a gospel message as well as Jeremy leading the time of worship but the song that he's got out right now that I love so much is entitled there will be a day 
And I want to share with you the first verse in the course as we close. The first verse says, I try to hold on to this world with everything I have, but I feel the weight of what it brings and the hurt that tries to grab. The many trials that seem to never end, his word declares this truth, that we will enter in his rest with wonders anew. But I hold on to this hope and the promise that he brings, that there will be a place with no more suffering. There will be a day with no more tears, no more pain, and no more fear. There will be a day when the burdens of this place will be no more. We'll see Jesus face to face. In Max Licato's book, The Applause of Heaven, it reads, Even though by the book, I'm guilty. By God's grace, I get another chance. Even though by the law, I'm indicted. By mercy, I'm given a fresh start. For it is by grace that you have been saved, not by works, so that no one can boast. Do you know no other religion in the world offers such a message? All the other religions demand the right performance, the right sacrifice, the right chant, the right ritual, the right seance or experience. Theirs is a kingdom of trade-offs and bartering. If you do this, God will give you that. And you know what the result always ends up being? Either arrogance or fear. Arrogance if you think you've achieved it, and fear if you think you haven't. The kingdom of God and of Jesus Christ is just the opposite. It is a kingdom for the poor. A kingdom where membership is granted, not purchased. You are placed into God's kingdom. You are adopted. And this occurs not when you do enough, but when you finally admit that you can't do enough. You don't earn it. You simply accept it. And as a result, you serve. Not out of arrogance or fear, but out of gratitude. You know, all heaven is interested in the cross of Christ. All hell is terribly afraid of it, while men are the only beings who more or less ignore its meaning, said Oswald Chambers many years ago. Jesus is a special delivery from heaven, a parcel of love being delivered to your home with your name upon it for salvation. And nothing in the world could stop the arrival of this parcel of love. Not the world itself, not Satan, not death, not hell, because it was signed and sealed and delivered at Calvary. But do you know one thing that has to happen? Even when a special delivery arrives on our doorstep, we've got to sign for it. We've got to sign to receive it. And in the same way, the Bible says that there is a sign. That you and I, not putting our name so much on a piece of paper, but surrendering our heart to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Father, not only for saving us from our sins, but for this glorious place that you are, I believe, even now still preparing for those who love you. For those who love your son, for those who believe that he came to this earth even as you sent him from heaven itself to die on that cross for our sins. Father, for all the glories that we looked at today, the glories of the saints, the glory of the city, the glory of you, our Father, and of your son, Jesus Christ, and the glory of us as your people. What I'm sure, Lord, is a poor job of me trying to describe a place of indescribable beauty. A place, Father, unlike any human eyes I've ever seen before. But I pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand all this and so much more is ours through Christ. That one day our life and the struggles of this life will be over. This earth will be made new. There will be a new heaven. And Lord, it's going to be so glorious, you say you're going to give us new bodies. 
to enjoy it and to experience it all. Father, I pray if there is one in this place this day that has never accepted your son and the salvation that he offers, the eternal home of heaven, that this be their day. We ask you these things in